Hello, uh, good afternoon, everybody. So uh, it's a pleasure for me uh, to introduce you, uh, Dr. Joan Seoane. He is a, a principal investigator of the Transcription Factors and uh, Cancer Laboratory at Valdebron Institute of Oncology in Barcelona. So he is uh, an expert in different fields of cancer research. And I guess that today he's, he will explain us I believe the, the most uh, productive, or one of the most productive lines of research in his uh, laboratory uh, related with the uh, leaf factor. And I have to say that uh, this is a, could be considered a really complete story. So I still remember from the very beginning of the research, uh, maybe a decade ago, uh, that the story now ended into a, a, an actual drug to treat patients. So this is a, a dream for any researcher. So let's uh, Joan explain us uh, that story that I believe it will be very interesting. When he finish, uh, any any questions will be very welcome. So Joan, please. Thank you so much, Hector. Uh, it is a fantastic pleasure to be here. I'm going to try to share uh, my my presentation. Uh, so first of all, uh, I want to I want to thank everybody. Uh, especially the organizers for this opportunity uh, to present here my work. Uh, I like it because it's an opportunity to show what we are doing in the lab, but especially I, I am very happy because I'm going to be able to acknowledge and thank all the efforts and, and help that I have, have had during all this time from the Bildebron community. And this is something that sometimes I, am, I don't have the time or I have the opportunity to, to really do thank everybody uh, in public and this is a nice opportunity uh, so first of all thank you everybody i'm going to talk about leaf a little bit in general uh, my my title was a little bit more specific i just changed it to a more general talk so that you can follow uh, the whole story of leaf um, let me begin by showing wait a second uh -huh. Now, I want to show my, first my disclosures. Uh, this is important, especially for the, this one here that says that I am the co-founder of Mosaic Biomedicals. At the end of the talk, I'm going to talk about uh, one compound that was generated by Mosaic, so that uh, you know. I'm, I'm also, I have some research grants from companies, and I also have the opportunity to be the Secretary General of the EACR, European Association for Cancer Research, and I am the board member of the Asociación Española contra el Cáncer. So my lab uh, uh, has been working uh, for a long time. I began here in Bail de Bron in 2004, uh, after being in the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. And we are, from the day one, trying to understand brain tumors, uh, both primary tumors and also metastatic tumors. And when I, when I came here uh, in 2004, I tried to do something different at that time and was to try to understand cancer as close as possible to the patient. So obtain samples from the surgery uh, room, thanks to a fantastic collaboration that we have with neurosurgeons, but also pathologists and oncologists, and try to, first of all, characterize those tumors. And we do that by sequencing, uh, gene expression, immunohistochemistry, but also by generating what I call uh, functional models. Uh, these are models that allow uh, uh, us to test hypotheses based on the characteristics. And for example, what we are doing is tumoroids, other people call them organoids, so these are three-dimensional cultures of, of, of tumor cells. We are also doing some organotypic cultures, and I'm going to talk about them later on. These are thick sections of the tumor that maintain the structure of the tissue, maintain the stroma, maintain the macrophages, uh, T cells, immune cells, endothelial cells. So it's a very interesting model that we are learning to use and we are really obtaining fantastic results. And finally, we uh, are generating what people call PDX, uh, patient-derived xenographs. This is when we take the sample from the tumor and we inoculate it Orthotopically, this is important, we put it in the brain of immune compromised mice, and then the cells of the tumor regenerate the tumor of the, of the patient in a mouse. So we can understand the biology of, of the tumors, but also we can use these models for uh, preclinical studies. So we have a lot of collaborations with companies trying to understand the mechanism of action of some of the compounds that are here in clinical trials. As you know, 
uh, we have several clinical trials in oncology and also at the end we try to help the patient in some way one of the things that we are also doing uh, i am very interested in um, in understanding whether we can uh, monitor and, and, and characterize tumors in a relatively non-invasive manner by using circulating biomarkers but, uh, especially in the cerebral spinal fluid one of the big problems in cancer as you as you know is heterogeneity and uh, cancer has several levels of heterogeneity you have interpatient heterogeneity so each tumor is different with different mutations and different characteristics uh, it not only that when you have a disseminated cancer uh, the metastatic lesions can be different and in a further level there is intratumoral heterogeneity meaning that the cells that are forming a tumor are different so this have this heterogeneity have has a huge implication in biology in the biology of these tumors but also in uh, in the clinical treatment of these patients because uh, the treatment of these patients will depend on the characteristics of the tumor of the lesion lesion but also on even the cells that are comp comp forming these tumors at another layer of complexity tumors are not only different but they change with time uh, tumors evolve and these normally following darwinian evolution so there is a selection that allows the fittest of the cells to grow and and be uh, having a, a selective advantage and this can happen for example uh, upon treatment when you have a tumor and you do surgery and then radiotherapy and chemotherapy you are really act, uh, killing many cells but then there are sometimes cells that are resistant to these treatments these are the ones that are selected selected by the treatments by the environment and these are the cells that will uh, prevail to regenerate a tumor but the consequence of all this is that the tumor of today is different from the tumor of yesterday and this has a very impli important implication that means that not only the heterogeneity is important to characterize at each patient each lesion each cell but you have to have it done in a particular time point you have to monitor the characteristics of a tumor during times so if you want to go into precision medicine or personalized medicine you need to know exactly how it is how is the, the the enemy is and you know need to know for example in this simplification whether the tumor has red cells green cells dark green cells and then eventually and optimally have a therapy to tackle all of these cells and get rid of the tumor because if you get rid of the red cells let's say the green cells will maintain will be there and then will we regrow and then regenerate the tumor and generate relapse and even could go into another location and generate metastasis and this is what we want to avoid so what is one of the big concepts in cancer is that we need to know we need to characterize tumors in order to select the optimal treatment and to characterize tumors normally you do it by biopsies and this is relatively easy if the tumor is in a accessible location for example a, mel a cutaneous melanoma you can have a simple a biopsy even in breast cancer is quite accessible but what happens in cancer in when the cancer is in the brain which is the tumor that i am studying well to obtain samples from these brain, brain tumors this is a very complex and risky situation because you have to do a surgical uh, uh procedure to go through the skull to go through normal um, brain tumor brain uh, tissue and then get into the tumor and then even sometimes this fragment of the tumor that you collect is not rep recapitulating the whole complexity of the tumor so this cannot even give you the proper uh, uh, information about the tumor that will lead to the identifying the, uh, the optimal treatment so during the last uh, five seven years there is a, a revolution and this is the concept of liquid biopsy we are realizing that sometimes you can characterize the tumor by just looking at the blood by doing a blood anal uh, analysis analysis tumor cells can get into the blood and then you have circulating tumor cells uh, you can also have exosomes you can have rna but importantly when the tumor grows some of the cells die and they release their dna into the bloodstream and thanks to the technological revolution that we are 
living today, in terms of sequ sequencing DNA, you can collect the DNA from the blood, sequence this DNA, and then know exactly which are the mutations of that tumor. And this, you can do it at different time points, since it is just a blood analysis, which is relatively very non-invasive. And so you can monitor the tumor growth and then adapt the treatment to the characteristics of the tumor. This is fantastic. And uh, I had the chance to write this review with uh, some colleagues because I think this is going to get into the clinical arena. It's already there in some tumor types, but it's going to be very general in order to really manage cancer, cancer patients and go through that complexity I was telling you at the very beginning, to go from that heterogeneity in terms of tumors, lesions, and cells, and know how this changes with time, and then adapt the treatment to these characteristics. But when we, thought, uh, we saw that, we thought, well, that will be fantastic because this is what we need in brain tumors, because we cannot get into the tumors without really a complex uh, uh, surgical procedure. Maybe we can do a uh, blood analysis. And we got frustrated pretty soon because we realized that there is no DNA, no CT DNA, circulating tumor DNA in the blood of these patients. And we thought, well, maybe the cerebral spinal fluid is something that will help us to characterize these tumors. And this is a very simple idea because, as you know, the cerebral spinal fluid is in intimate contact with the brain parenchyma and hence with the tumors. And so it's obvious to think that maybe uh, the ctDNA will be present in the CSF rather than in the blood. But this is the typical idea that is easy to have, but very difficult to, to validate. And this, I have to say, I have to again acknowledge all the help from the Bildebrand community, especially in neurosurgery, pathology, uh, oncology, to really validate this hypothesis because we, we were able to demonstrate for the first time that the CSF, the cerebral spinal fluid, is a better source of uh, ctDNA uh, than blood when dealing with brain tumors. So we were able to generate a program of uh, warm autopsies and rapid autopsies. I'm here showing one case where in that autopsy, we were able to obtain samples from different lesions in patients, but then also samples from the plasma and the CSF of these patients. We did sequencing. We really characterized the heterogeneity of these lesions, and we were doing, able to do phylogenetic analysis to really know what are the gene mutations that are different between lesions. But one of the observations we had is that the CSF was collecting a lot of ctDNA, and with that ctDNA, we could characterize the brain lesions. But then when we look specifically for uh, in patients with restricted CNS diseases, meaning patients that only they had uh, tumors in the brain, not tumors in any other location, extracranial lo location, we found that the ctDNA, the circulating tumor DNA, was only present in the CSF and not in the plasma. And this was, as I said, the first time that was published, we were, were able to publish this, and since then, uh, that was a pub publication in 2015. This is the first one. And then since then, we have really contributed to the field with many other publications showing that this is important for brain metastasis, diffuse glioma, uh, CNS lymphoma, and medulloblastoma. And again here, uh, with a fantastic collaboration with uh, people from Bailebron. So we were able to, to, to write this review uh, where we... Uh, proposed that the CSF ctDNA, so the circulating tumor DNA, cell-free circulating tumor DNA that is present in the CSF allows you to characterize uh, and, and help, help in the diagnosis, help I understand the prognosis of these tumors, find uh, actionable genomic alterations. Sometimes you can find mutations that can tell you which is the treatment for these patients. For example, EGFR mutations in brain metastasis from lung or uh, they can allow you to also to monitor tumor, tumor burden, and this is important when dealing, for example, with uh, concepts of pseudo-progression. And also uh, uh, monitor evolving heterogeneity, see how these tumors change with relapse, and this is, for example, very important in medulloblastoma. Very recently, we were able to go one step further, and we decided not to analyze the ctDNA in the CSF, but the immune cells in the CSF. And this is very important in tumors that can respond to immunotherapy, such as lung and melanoma, that they tend to go to the brain 
uh, uh, into the brain, to metastasize into the brain. And so we decided to analyze these immune cells in the CSF in order to see if you can characterize the tumor in the brain by just anal analyzing the CSF. And the answer is yes. We were able to do single cell RNA-seq. We were able to see how the cells in the tumor, the immune cells in the cell tumor clusterize, co-clusterize with the cells present in the CSF. And so with this way, we could see that if a tumor is inflamed, you can see a lot of T cells in the in the CSF, and these can predict response to immune therapy. So by a lumbar puncture, you can know whether the brain metastasis could uh, uh, respond to uh, immune therapy. Just very fast because I don't have too much time, but this in this figure, for example, each of these dots, the gray dots, are immune cells from the lesion, from the tumor, while the blue dots are the immune cells from the CSF. We, we, you can see how they co-cluster, and these different regions, ones are T cells, NK cells, macrophages, and others. And you see that you can recapitulate the landscape, the immune landscape of the tumor in the CSF, and also see how this changes at different time points. So in, I went very fast with this first part of the talk because I wanted to focus a little bit more into the leaf story. And the leaf story begins with uh, an obsession I had at the very beginning, uh, which is the intratumoral heterogeneity. And not the genomic intratumoral heterogeneity, not the fact that cells within a tumor have different mutations, but the fact that cells within a tumor have different states of differentiation. And some cells have stem cell-like characteristics. They recapitulate the characteristics of stem cells. And so they have this plasticity to differentiate into different uh, lineages, but importantly, they have the ability to initiate and reinitiate tumors. And I was very interested in this because in glioblastoma, even if the patient in the surgeon does a complete resection, the cells that are remaining, they all always relapse. So there are cancer initiating cells in the in the niche, in the surgical niche, that allows to, re, uh, to regenerate the tumor and relapse, and this is what is fatal for the patient. So I wanted to identify those cells in order to really develop compounds to tackle this, these cells and eliminate relapse. In other tumor types, besides glioblastoma, this is also important for metastasis, because metastasis is the reinitiation of a tumor in another location by also cancer-initiating cells. So that's why I call them cancer-initiating cells rather than cancer stem cells. So I'm not going to get into that, but long time ago, already 12 years ago, we were able to find a cellular entity that was characterized by the expression of CD44 and ID1, the transcription factor ID1. These uh, cancer-initiating cells were depending on, on one factor, one cytokine called LEAF. LEAF, what it did was induce the self-renewal of these cancer-initiating cells preventing differentiation. So in tumors that have high levels of leaf, if you block, block leaf, the CD44 high ID1 positive cells became CD44 low and lost their ability to initiate cancer, initiate, uh, sorry, to initiate tumors, losing their characteristics as cancer initiating cells. So that was very interesting because leaf was a therapeutic target to really tackle cancer initiating cells as I was looking for. So I decided to go deeper into LIF. LIF is a cytokine, as I said, of the IL-6 family of cytokines. It signals through an heterodimer of receptors, the LIF receptor and the GP130, and it can signal through different pathways. The main one is the JAK-STAT3 pathway. One of the first observations that really was really striking is the heterogeneity of expression in, in, of LIF in tumors. So there are tumors that have huge amounts of leaf and tumors that do not express leaf. So there is other rank levels of leaf in glioblastoma, non-small cell lung cancer, ovarian cancer, and pancreatic cancer. And the fact that there are other rank levels of leaf in some tumors made me think that maybe high levels of leaf was providing a, a selective advantage to these tumors, was helping the tumor to grow. That, that's why there was such a huge amount of leaf. And this was in some way corroborated by the fact that tumors that have very high levels of leaf tend to be 
to do worse. They are more aggressive. In fact, LIF confers poor prognosis to glioma, to glioblastoma, and some other authors later on, they show that this is the case for head and neck, lung, and colorectal cancer. So in all these tumors, high levels of LIF correlate, correlates with poor prognosis. So that was telling me that maybe LIF was important in oncogenesis. But then is when I, I did something that I, I always recommend everybody. And it's like, go out of the box, no? It's just you are all the time concentrated in studying your particular question. And sometimes it's good to step far back and, and look at other, uh, other situations, other problems. And at that time, I decided to go into embryogenesis. And I, I read very interesting uh, stuff related leaf to embryogenesis. And as some of you know, I mean, embryogenesis is fascinating. And leaf has a crucial role in embryogenesis in two steps. One, leaf is fundamental for embryonic stem cell self renewal. In fact, leaf prevents early differentiation of embryonic stem cell self renewal. So, what it does is sets the pace of the embryonic stem cells so that they can differentiate at the right time to really generate an embryo. Well, here you begin to see the parallelism with what we found in cancer-initiating cells, where also LIF was regulating, is regulating cancer-initiating cells, self renewal inhibiting differentiation. But the other step where LIF is very fun, uh, uh, important is another very important role, very important step, where the ablastocyst has to implant into the uterus of the mother. And this is a very complex uh, process where the blastocyst has to contact the, the uterus. First of all, it has to invade the tissue. And here you see some parallelism with cancer. Cancer also invades the surrounding tissues. It has to have angiogenesis, again, like cancer, that needs angiogenesis to obtain the nutrients from the, from the blood vessels. But importantly, all mammals have a huge problem, and is that the embryo has antigens from the father. So how come when it, it implants into the uterus of the mother, the mother does not react against the antigens of the father? Why is that the immune system of the mother does not, does not recognize the antigens of the father and rejects the, tube, the, the embryo? Well, the answer is that leaf is fundamental for that. What leaf does is generates a local immune suppression that allows the embryo to implant. And then the placenta is generated, which is the professional system to, regulate, to, to really regulate the immune system. <clears throat> but at the very beginning, at the very first contact, leaf is fundamental to generate this immune suppression. And this is known because, for example, there are uh, leaf knockout animal models, leaf knockout mice. These, these mice are sterile because they reject the embryo. And if you take a, a knockout embryo and you put it in a wild type mother, the mother, the uterus generates leaf and allows the embryo to implant and then you have viable pups. So that is something that is really, really important for embryo uh, development. There are also women that have lots of function mutations in leaf. And these women are healthy, but they are also sterile and they cannot even perform in vitro fertilization procedures because they reject the embryo. So this was very interesting because we were building this parallelism between embryogenesis and cancer. That means that uh, leaf is fundamental for embryo implantation and, embryo, and the local immune suppression that allows the embryo to implant. In terms of the immune suppression, it's very interesting because there are several papers showing that leaf is also important for organ transplantation tolerance, also by inducing immune suppression, and also important in multiple sclerosis, also regulating the immune system. So the question was very simple. In those tumors where you have huge amounts of, of, <coughs> of, of leaf, is leaf doing the same? Is it regulating the cancer-initiating cells, as we see, as we saw in our first papers? And importantly, is it leaf generating this immune suppression in order to protect the, um, the tumor from the uh, uh, immune system from the host? And to answer this question, we began by using uh, bioinformatic uh, uh, analysis. And basically what we thought was, well, let's go into databases 
with thousands of tumors that are characterized and ask why, which are the immune cells that correlate with LIF. And we show that in certain tumors, for example, in glioblastoma and in ovarian, there is a very nice correlation between LIF and tumor-associated macrophages, with the macrophages that are within the tumor uh, that we call TAMs. So that was the first clue that maybe LIF might be in, uh, signaling in macrophages, and this is important for, uh, for cancer. Uh, what we did, we did also was uh, to generate an animal model to really uh, see whether the blockade of leaf could have an anti-tumoral effect. Uh, we need to do an immune competent model because we wanted to understand the role of leaf in the immune system. So we generated a syngenic animal model of glioblastoma. This is a glioblastoma cell line from mouse that we can inoculate in the brain of immune-competent mice. And these cells were expressing luciferase so that we can monitor tumor growth by bioluminescence. Bio I don't see, I mean, if you see here, when we treat these mice with anti-leaf, with a blocking antibody against leaf, the tumor were not able to grow as fast as the control uh, tumor. And then when we characterize these tumors, we found that, first of all, a very clear decrease in phosphostat 3. This means that in these tumors that have high levels of leaf, leaf is the main factor for inducing phosphostat 3. This was not expected because there are many factors that regulate phosphostat 3, but in these tumors, leaf is the main one. We didn't see an effect in proliferation, so the KI67 was similar. We saw a very clear increase in cliff caspase 3, so there is an increase in apoptosis, and the critical observation was that there is a very clear increase in CD80 cell infiltration that we saw here by immunohistochemistry, but also by flow cytometry. We saw something very similar in another model. Instead of glioblastoma, this is a syngenic animal model of ovarian cancer. Uh, this is using the mouse cell line called ID8. We inoculate this uh, cell line in an immune-competent mice mouse, we treat these mice with uh, this anti-leaf, there is a decrease in tumor growth, clear effect in phosphostat 3, again, these tumors have high levels of leaf, and a very clear increase in CD80 cell infiltration, both by immunohistochemistry and by flow cytometry. So, linking both concepts, we thought, well, maybe TAMS, tumor-associated macrophages, will be important for the regulation of oncogenesis by leaf. And so we performed the following experiment. You, we took our models, both the GBM model, glioblastoma model, and the ovarian cancer model, the GL261N and the ID8, and we isolated. So first of all, the mice were treated with anti-leaf, and then we isolated tumor-associated macrophages from these tumors. We performed transcriptomic analysis, and what we found is that several cytokines were regulated by the antibody, such as CCL2, CD163, CD206. But then what was fantastic is that there was a very nice increase in one cytokine, in one chemokine called CXCL9. And that was the critical uh, factor to really understand what was going on because CXCL9 is a critical factor for CD80 cell infiltration. CXCL9 is a chemoattractant and attracts cells that express the receptor of CXCL9, which is CXCR3. And this receptor is present in CD80 cells, but also in NK cells. And so in this very nice re review by Chen and Melman, they show that CXCL9 is the crucial factor to really increase the CD80 cell into the tumor. So if the blocking of leaf was increasing CD CXCL9, that may be the mediator of the, in the induction of CD80 cell infiltration. And we validated this result. Here you see this, the, the result. We, we have these uh, mice with a, a GBM tumor. We treat with anti-leaf. As I told you, there is an increase in CD80 cell infiltration. But then when we block leaf and CXCL9, this increase is gone, indicating that the CXCL9 is the mediator of the induction of CD80 cell infiltration. We perform another experiment. In this case, we use our antibody and we look for, for tumor growth by bioluminescence. There is a clear decrease in tumor growth with the antibody. 
when we use a concomitant antibody against CCL2, one of the factors that are regulated by anti-leaf, there is no major effect, the tumor grows less. Also, when we use a knockout animal model of CCL2, there is no effect in anti-tumor uh, response to anti-leaf. Well, when we use the antibody against CXCL9 or a CXCL9 knockout, we see no effect of the anti-leaf, indicating that the anti-tumoral effect in this particular model is mediated by CXCL9. We decided to go to humans. This is something I, I told you at the very beginning. Uh, we always look to try to understand the biology of cancer as close as possible to tumors. And what we did was to obtain tumors from, from patients undergoing surgery here in the hospital. And we perform organotypic cultures that this is what I told you. These are thick sections of the tumor that maintain the architecture of the tissue, maintain the stroma, maintain the macrophages, immune cells, and endothelial cells. You can grow them for 10, 15 days in semi-dry conditions. This is already uh, used in many other fields, such as, for example, neuroscience. And what you can do is you can treat these organotypic cultures, for example, using anti-leaf. And this is what we did. We selected three patients with high levels, with tumors expressing very high levels of leaf. We treat these organotypic cultures with anti-leaf, and we found that indeed, when we block leaf, you see a, a, a decrease in uh, CCL2, a decrease in CD163, decrease in CD206 in macrophages, and then a very clear increase in CXCL9, as we were seeing in our animal models. So we were recapitulating in humans what we found in, in mice. We perform a further, co more complex uh, model where we are using our organotypic cultures, but then we put we, we put on top of of the cultures the same leukocytes. Sorry, the leukocytes from the same patient that donates the tumor. So these are the same PBMCs of the patient. We put them on top of these cultures. These cultures are in matrigel. Uh, we treat these cultures with anti-leaf, and you see a very nice increase. This uh, dots here, these green dots are immune cells that get into the matrigel to get into the tumor in response to anti-leaf. And so this was exactly what we were expecting. We thought, well, could this be regulated by CXCL9? So we did the same experiment, in this case, blocking anti-leaf and CXCL9, and we found that the infiltration of CD80 cells was blunted by the blocking of CXCL9, indicating again that this infiltration is mediated by CXCL9. Again, what we did is an in vivo experiment. In this case, we take the sample of the tumor from the patient. We inoculate a mouse with that. In this case, an immune compromised mouse. And then we inoculate the leukocytes from the same patient that donates the tumor into the bloodstream of these mice. We treat the mice with anti-leaf. And then we assess how the CD80 cells are present or not in the tumor. As I said, these mice are immune compromised mice where they don't have CD80 cells. We put CD80 cells from the patient, and then we see that when you, will, you block uh, uh, you, when you block leaf, you see a very clear increase in CD80 cells in the tumor in these four different patients, indicating again that we are seeing the effect that we were expecting in patients. Finally, we did a very cool technology, which is similar to what I just told you, but in this case, we took the PBMCs from the patient. We isolate CD3 positive uh, T cells. We infect them. We do a quick infection with luciferase, with a lentivirus expressing luciferase. And then we inoculate these uh, T cells. And then thanks to the luciferase, we can monitor the T cells. And then by bioluminescence, we can see how they get into the tumor. They concentrate. And we see a signal, very nice signal here. So all this data was telling us that LEAF was controlling in some way the CD80 cell infiltration. And this has a very important context, uh, co um, uh, implication in immune therapy. Because what is known is that there are tumors that they are called cold. Uh, that means that they don't have immune cells or very few immune cells. They are non-inflamed. And then there are tumors that are hot. They are very inflamed. Well, tumors that are hot inflamed are the ones that better respond to immune therapy, in particular to ch immune checkpoint inhibitors. So what we were observing is that anti-leaf induce the infiltration of CD80 cells, converting a cold tumor into a hot tumor. If this is true, well, but we could combine anti-leaf with anti-PD-1, an immune checkpoint inhibitor, 
in a way that a cold tumor, we convert it in a hot tumor by anti-leaf, and then we hit this hot tumor with an immune checkpoint inhibitor to activate T cells and get an anti-tumoral response. To validate this hypothesis, we use the uh, Syngenic GBN model. In this case, we inoculate the cells. We wait the, cell, uh, the, the cells to generate a full-blown tumor, very difficult to treat. These tumors barely respond to anti-leaf. Here, the green, the green bars. They're, they don't respond to PD-1. Uh, they are resistant to immune checkpoint inhibitors. But what was very cool was that when we combine anti-leaf and anti-PD-1, we see tumor regression. That means the tumor disappears. In some patients, in some mice, it's completely gone, and there is a prolonged survival. And that was what was very interesting is that when we take these mice, where you have a complete regression, and then you re-inoculate with immune cell, uh, sorry, with uh, the same uh, GL261N cells, 300,000, well, these cells cannot generate a, a tumor. Here you have uh, the experiment. You take all these naive mice. You inoculate them with 300,000 cells of GL261N. You see that there is there are tumors. These tumors will kill the mice. If you take mouse mice from the previous experiment with a complete regression, you re-inoculate immune cell, uh, sorry sorry GL261 cells. These cells cannot grow, and these tumors uh, uh, so and these mice are have immune memory. That means that the immune system is recognizing those cells and getting rid of them. And in this real challenge experiment. So what basically uh, found we found is that there are tumors with very high levels of leaf, aberrantly high levels of leaf. These tumors tend to be aggressive. These tumors tend to have TAMs, tumor-associated macrophages. We know that leaf signals through TAMs. In fact, I have not shown you, but TAMs express the leaf receptor. Their leaf regulates several factors, such as CCL2, CD163, CD206. But importantly, leaf silences the CXCL9 locus, the CXCL9 gene, so that CXCL9 cannot be induced. In these tumors, when you block leaf, you have a decrease in CCL2, CD163, CD206, but importantly, you release the expression of CXCL9. I have not sh shown you the data, but we know that this regulation is epigenetic, so leaf silences CXCL9 by an epigenetic, by methylation of the promoter of CXCL9. You block leaf, CXCL9 is, can be released, and hence can recruit CD80 cells into the tumor, generating an infiltrated tumor, an inflamed tumor that can then respond to anti PD1 and uh, to, can respond to immune checkpoint inhibitors. So, with all this data, both the data in, in the cancer stem cells or the data in the immune system, we thought that the leaf could be a good therapeutic target. And so, some time ago, we decided to uh, generate an antibody a fully humanized neutralizing antibody against leaf that we called MSC1 because this antibody was developed in our company, the spin-off that we funded here uh, uh, called Mosaic Biomedical. And this spin-off is par participated by the Beer, Bio, and ICREA. We have done several experiments with MSC1. I'm not showing the, you the data. One of the very interesting experiments is we could perform a crystal structure of the antibody bound to leaf in order to understand how, the how this antibody blocked the signaling pathway. The answer is that the antibody binds to leaf. The complex antibody leaf can bind to the leaf receptor, but this complex abolished the binding with the other member of the heterodimer, GP130, blocking the, anti the, the signaling. So that was kind of unexpected because what we thought is that the antibody was interfering between the binding of leaf to the leaf receptor. In fact, what it does is interferes between the binding of leaf receptor and GP130. We were able to perform a clinical trial, and this clinical trial was a phase one clinical trial that we could do in Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, one of the best, if not the best, cancer centers in the world. Uh, we did it also in the Princess Margaret uh, Hospital, the best uh, hospital in Canada, and the Baile Lebron Hospital, I would argue that is the best uh, hospital in Spain. Uh, we were able to do this phase one clinical trial. Uh, we we uh, saw that there is no toxicity. This was kind of expected because of those women, if you remember, that have lots of function mutations in leaf. These women are healthy. Well, these patients didn't have uh, any problems with the antibody. 
we come up with a dose in this case was 1500 milligrams and what was very very interesting is that we were able to obtain biopsies pre and on target on treatment sorry pre and on treatment of these patients of some of these patients and what was really amazing is that in some patients not all of them we could see an infiltration of cd80 cells in response to antilif exactly what we were seeing in our uh, models in preclinical models so here you see an example this is the pre-treatment biopsy this is the on-treatment biopsy uh, you see the yellow cells are the cd80 cells there is a huge infiltration of cd80 cells and also we saw a decrease in cd163 a decrease in cd206 uh, indicating that there is a shift between this m2 like uh, phenotype of macrophages into an m1 like uh, phenotype of macrophages one of also the striking results was the levels of phosphostat 3 in some patients were decreased as similarly as we were seeing in our animal models again this was not expected because there are many factors that regulate phosphostat 3 but in these tumors it seems that leaf is the fundamental the main factor to induce this uh, signaling pathway and maybe this is a key to to these trials we are right now as you can see going into into phase two so this is something we are going to do uh, uh, by the end of the year we are really excited and one of the obsessions one of the critical questions we want to understand is which are the patients that might benefit from this compound in combination with anti pd1 and this is the type of uh, research we are doing right now in the lab trying to understand in which patients you have uh, cd80 cell infiltration in which patients you have this shift in macrophages what happens with phosphostat 3 in order to find biomarkers that will allow us to identify the patients that should be treated with anti-leaf and in this way have a better response in our clinical trial so what i think it's very interesting of this of, of this work is this very nice par parallelism between embryogenesis and cancer right cancer does not invent the wheel it's not doing something very weird it's just hijacking a normal developmental process that has been the, uh, designed by evolution during millions and millions of years to solve a problem that all mammals have and is the problem that in mammals one being has to be integrated in another being so with different antigens and so you have to deal with the immune system so evolution comes up with the leaf factor to really generate this local immune suppression well cancer hijacks this process for its own benefit and hence leaf is important in tumors because they protect leaf protects the tumor from the immune system of the host the same way that leaf protects the embryo from the immune system of the mother and on top of that there is the effect on embryonic stem cells and in cancer stem cells so they have this dual effect by by leaf but thinking about that and thinking about that very important question is which are the tumors that should be uh, regulated by leaf and should be treated with leaf we thought about viruses and one of the questions we 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 wanted to understand is why why are there tumors with such a huge amounts of leaf and one of the answer to these questions was that we found that some viruses that are associated to tumors such as some head and neck tumors cervix cancer that are associated uh, with papilloma virus or even some head and neck tumors such as nasopharyngeal cancer associated to epstein bar is the virus that induces leaf and so we thought well maybe the virus induces leaf to protect the virus from the immune system again hijacking the developmental process of embryogenesis in this case to benefit the virus but the virus is within a tumor so that the the leaf protects the tumor so just for the people that are not in oncology you know that some tumors are associated with viruses so there there is the cervix uh, cancer that have all of them are infected with papilloma virus or the head and neck some of them are infected with papilloma virus and nasopharyngeal cancer they are infected with epstein barr virus what we found is that the virus induces leaf and what we think is that this is beneficial for the virus protecting the virus from the immune system and also for the tumor that contains the virus and thinking about that and, and 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 in this in this pathway the pandemic came we had COVID 19 
coming uh, the whole world. And we had the obvious question is, could COVID-19 patients express leave? Could SARS-CoV-2 SARS -CoV induce, uh, induce leave as, for example, papilloma viruses? And we performed a, a, a project that was uh, funded by the Generalitat de Catalunya. And the project was, well, first of all, is leaf expressing in, in patients? And the answer is yes. This is uh, an analysis of 38 patients uh, in the blood. And we found that some of them express very high levels of leaf. I'm not showing the data because there is not too much time, but we know that leaf is also very important in controlling type 1 interferon 6 CL9 in these patients. We found that in, 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 in the lungs of these patients, there is expression of leaf. I'm not going to get into the details, but here we are seeing a cluster of the, sorry, of the red samples that are the lungs of COVID-19 patients with lung tumors. And so they have a similar pattern of inflammation with leaf expression there. And then we thought, well, what happens in women that are pregnant? and they are infected with COVID-19 uh, uh, COVID sorry, and infected with SARS-CoV-2 and they, they suffer COVID-19 disease. Well, I had the opportunity to collaborate with uh, Dr. Paolo Nusiforo. We were able to characterize placentas from women that, uh, pregnant women uh, that were infected with SARS-CoV-2 and we were able also to see that most of the placenta were not affected. There was not vertical trans transmission of the virus between the mother and the fetus. But there was one case where the placenta was infected. This affected the functionality of the placenta. Then the fetus was affected also by the virus, not by the direct infection, but by, by the fact that the placenta was not really functional, fully functional. And then what we found is that the pattern of inflammation of this placenta has very high levels of leaf indicated that again, leaf could have a very important role in COVID-19. And this is something we are still working uh, uh, to see whether leaf could be a good therapeutic target in this context. With this, I want to finish. I want to acknowledge everybody. I just listed uh, some of the uh, people that have helped here, but along during this all, uh, almost uh, 16 years, I have collaborated with many people in Val Lebron. Uh, I want to acknowledge first the people in my lab, Monica Pascual, um, Esther Planas, Esther Bonfil, uh, Rafaela Yurlaru, and others. I want to acknowledge the people in neurosurgery, especially Fran Martinez Ricarte, he has been fundamental for all this work, and Dr. Sauquillo, pathology, uh, Paolo Nuciforo, but also Elena Martinez Saez and Santiago Ramon y Cajal, medical oncologist, all the oncologists of the medical department, medical oncology department. Uh, I, I can name all of them. Uh, I want to name, for example, Dr. Tabernero, of course, as, as a representation of all of them. Uh, pediatrics team for the medulloblastoma. Thank you so much. Uh, Sole Gallego, Ana Yort, Raquel, Hadlun. Uh, immunology for the last part of the COVID-19 and microbiology. I also want to acknowledge Josep Kerr to, to help me induce all these things. I will, I'm, it's not here, but I want to acknowledge also Carmen Escrepejo. At the very beginning, she helped me very much with all the immune system and LEAF, and she's an author of, uh, of one of my papers. I want to acknowledge many people that are not here listed in Bailebron, and I'm so very happy to have this opportunity to, to really thank you all. Also, I want to acknowledge the people in the clinic. Uh, we are collecting samples from brain metastasis and glioblastoma from the clinic also, and I want to acknowledge Lady Pedrosa and uh, 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 Estela, I'm sorry about that, Estela Pineda, I, I, this is a typo. And uh, also the funding agencies, uh, principally I want to acknowledge the Asociación Española contra el Cancer and the Federal Foundation. And now I'm, uh, I want to fin find, end this talk by having just a, a thought uh, for uh, Josep Baselga. I want to thank him very much. He was the one who hired me when I was in New York and I didn't know too much what to do. I was in Memorial Sloan Kettering, had some opportunities to stay in the, in the States. He was really uh, very uh, adamant to tell me to come back to Barcelona and to buy Lebron. He helped me uh, begin my lab here. He has helped me all the time and he has been my mentor. 
he is a he was a fantastic uh, physician, uh, researcher, scientist, and mentor. And I, we will miss you. We, we will miss him a lot. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions that you guys will have. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, Juan. Um, I've been reading some of the, um, the questions about your talk. And um, I think that um, two of them actually are related with uh, a recurrent question on your on your talks. This is about uh, oh, how is leaf regulated? So even there is a, there is um, someone in the audience uh, uh, that is uh, mentioning your paper on on TJ beta inducing leaf. And is wondering whether TJ beta inhibitors and immunotherapy uh, would be as efficient as uh, anti leaf plus immunotherapy, or is that not uh, is that making sense for you? So that that would be our first question. Yeah, that's a very good question, and this is something we described in our first paper in 2009. No, TJ beta can induce leaf, but when you characterize other tumor types in and even in glioblastoma. It's not always the case. There are some tumors that have very high levels of leaf, and in those tumors, there is no TJ beta, or in some cases, even TJ beta cannot induce leaf. So the way I see this is that leaf, uh, sorry, TJ beta can induce leaf in certain contexts, in certain tumor types, but not in all of them. Uh, and th this is a very important point because, as I told you, we want to understand why some tumors have such a huge amount of leaf. This is not, uh, teacher beta can be part of this answer, but it's not for sure the most important one. One of the things, for example, we are observing is the, in these tumors that are associated to viruses, the virus through an, uh, a protein encoded by the virus genome is the one that induces leaf. And there are a couple of papers showing that KRAS can also induce leaf. It seems a little bit more complex. Uh, we are working on that. Okay, so I see now people is getting more excited with the questions. Uh, so um, I, there, there's people also asking about a bit more about um, uh, leaf signaling itself. So, so is leaf also uh, activating other other pathways beyond the uh, uh, stats that you mentioned uh, that could also uh, be relevant for for its function? Yes, uh, indeed. I mean, the JAK-STAT3 pathway is the one that is be the best well characterized, but LEAF has been involved in the induction of the PI3K AKT pathway, also the MAT kinase pathway, also the NOTCH pathway, also the, the, the YAP pathway. So there are several pathways that are downstream of LEAF. Still not very sure how these different pathways are implicated in the different pleiotropic responses to LEAF. This is something that we have to do. But what is interesting is that uh, what we see in, uh, in our models is that the phosphostat 3 pathway seems to be crucial for the anti-tumoral effect in our models. And so we think that that pathway is very relevant. It's true that other authors have shown that, for example, uh, the, the YAP pathway can be also very important in cancer, but it might be that there are a, a uh, pleiotropic response depending on different pathways. Okay, so um, let me, uh, I have here four more questions, if you may go uh, quicker through them. Um, one is related to the CD8 uh, positive cell, so uh, the question is, have you, have you seen uh, any changes in peripheral blood uh, after treatment with your anti-leaf uh, antibody, I guess. That's the question, I guess. Uh, so thinking about a more systemic effect of your, 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 your drug as an immunomodulator beyond the tumor? Yeah, well, that's a, a very good question. Unfortunately, we have not done a thorough analysis of the effect of, for example, the anti-leaf in the immune cells in the blood. Uh, this we have not done. We have focused specifically in the tumor, in the immune cells in the tumor. And, but that's a very important question. Still, uh, what we know in patients treated with anti-leaf, there is no major effect 
in uh, in uh, in parameters uh, related to the immune cells in in the blood because this was uh, tested in the phase one clinical trial. Okay, so so here is a question about um, COVID nineteen. So there is a curiosity that says asking about if you have seen uh, different concentrations depending on the severity of the COVID. That's one question, and in this the same. Uh, person is asking about if uh, if it correlates with other cytokines that are released during um, the COVID um, this, uh, disease. So. This is a fantastic question. This is still work in progress. Uh, I have to say, and, and here again, you have the opportunity to thank uh, specifically here the, the people in the immunology department, Manuel Hernandez and Ricard Pujol. We are doing this together. Uh, still early days, but I think it will be very interesting to see uh, well, to answer those questions, I, I unfortunately I cannot answer that them now, but I hope I will be able to answer them uh, at short term. Short term, but important to see how leaf is expressed at different states of the of the disease. Also, if it correlates with other cytokines, this is fundamental to really understand what's going on in these patients. I think that uh, for finishing, you you may uh, have still time to answer two other questions. One yeah. is related is asking if there is other there are other immune cells uh, in addition to TAMs that express the leaf receptor and could also contribute to the uh, secretion of CXCL9. Yes, uh, the, the the answer is yes. And for example, right now we are seeing that dendritic cells have a lot of leaf receptor and we think that this could be very very relevant leaf receptor is also expressed in tumor cells and here we are dealing with the heterogeneity of cancer that we always have some tumors have high levels of leaf receptor in the tumor cells for example glioblastoma some tumors they have leaf receptor uh, in in the stroma macrophages now we are seeing dendritic cells so it depends a little bit on the tumor type okay so, so I think that as a final question, uh, because I cannot read more, and I think that that would be all. It is uh, someone asking about the potential effect of leaf on the vasculature. I guess the uh, tumor vasculature itself. I think that you mentioned something uh, just superficially, but uh, it may also uh, impact on the tumor vasculature. Is that right? Have you seen that? Well, that's a very good question, and in fact, it's related to the previous one. Uh, we know that endothelial cells can express leaf receptor, very high levels of leaf receptor, and so we think that leaf could be also important in endothelial cells and hence in angiogenesis. It's important to say that uh, leaf it, it could be regulating also uh, the angiogenesis process in the embryo implantation, so that's something that could be also, again, this parallelism with, with tumors. Uh, I'm not saying that leaf is, fun is the critical factor in embryogenesis. I think that leaf is involved in embry embryogenesis. Uh, there may be other factors, but leaf has a very important role. And I know it because the loss of function of leaf really has an impact in, in the ability of the embryo to implant. Okay. I think that uh, this has been many, many, many questions. I have quite interesting audience. And I just, to finish, I want to tell you that in most of the questions are proceed with a congratulations for your job and uh, for the great talk. Uh, and, and I also say the same. So I guess that uh, that's all. And thank you very much for your uh, sharing your investigation with us. Thank you. Thank you, Hector, for, the, for your kind sharing of my talk. I want to again thank and apologize. I know that some people that have helped me helped me are not uh, acknowledged. I want to apologize uh, for them, but I want to really tell everybody that I am really happy to be here in Bailebron in this context. And, and I really I want to appreciate the help that everybody has done to me uh, and be able to do this work. Without them, I wouldn't be able to do it. And thank you for this opportunity to share it with you at home. I'm playing at home here. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, bye. Bye.